Right. Hi, welcome to BIM's Week. This is BIM's Reads, a new initiative to highlight Black authors who write about the ocean. I'm Chris Howard, the Chief Relations Officer here at BIMS, and today we will be reading Mermaid Kinsey, Protector of the Deep, which Charlotte's conversation will be moderated by Alexis Cooper, an education specialist with the National Aquarium in Baltimore. So I'll pass it to you, Alexis. Thank you so much, Chris. Ms. Charlotte Watson Sherman was born in Seattle, the Emerald City. She is author of Brown Sugar Babe and Mermaid Kenzie, Protector of the Deeps. She lives in Southern California near Harbor, where sea lions can honk all night long. Now, let's begin with a short video from Ms. Charlotte. Ms. Charlotte, take it away. Hi, um, thank you for, I wanna thank Black and Marine Science for um, having me here uh, during this week of exciting activities. Um, I'm in awe of scientists, especially Black scientists, and so was thrilled to find out about your organization and the work that you're doing, and just really grateful for the fact that our young people um, can have access uh, to your information and to your people. Uh, and get to see themselves uh, in the ocean in these uh, various ways and, and uh, professions. So um, I'm Charlotte and uh, let's see. Okay, I'm from Seattle, Washington, um, where there are a lot of bodies of water. There's rivers, lakes, there's Puget Sound. Uh, we're a couple of hours from the ocean so I've been lucky enough to live most of my life um, inside of water and my love for it and the symbol symbolism it has for us as black people only continues to grow. Next, please. I'm gonna um, be going through some, actually my daughter is going through some slides. There's a, um, um, this mark is on the slides because of a, a video that's coming up. But um, I'll be going through some slides and then I'll actually read from Mermaid Kinsey, Protector of the Deeps. Uh, it doesn't, it publishes uh, January 18th. Um, so many of us have a spiritual connection to water. Um, it's part of our history as people of African descent. Uh, it can represent tears, sorrow, joy, sustenance, life, departure, return, and hope. It connects us to our ancestors. Uh, next, please. Uh, hopefully, many of us have seen uh, this beautiful picture book that came out last week, the 1619 Projects Born on the Water. Um, and uh, it, that's it's about our history, how we were kidnapped from Africa, packed into the bottoms of ships that sailed across the Atlantic Ocean, how many people became one people, a new people. And that is why people say we were born on the water. Next, please. And you can see how water seeped into our old songs like Wade in the Water. Um, this was a song that Harriet, Harriet, Tubman, Hub, ugh, Harriet Tubman used to tell runaways to get into the water so no one or nothing could catch their scent. Next, please. And it's in our poems. Wait, I'm sorry, just one second. Z, if you could get that black mark off. Um, it's in our poems like uh, The Negro Speaks of Rivers by Langston Hughes. I've known rivers. I've known rivers ancient as the world and older than the flow of human blood and human veins. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. And then I can't, next please. And then I can't think of water without remembering the Ibu landing myth. I, I, I'm going to just say, I'm sorry, it's, I'm in uh, Southern California, it's really foggy here. And so if you hear that, fo those fog horns uh, in the background, that's because it's like, it's almost totally white outside from fog. So I apologize for that sound. So any, anyway, I can't think of water without remembering the Ibu landing myth. And this is where some Ibu captives, they were Af African captives of the Ibu ethnic group who were brought to the new world and then refused to live in slavery. There are accounts of them having walked into the water and then on top of the water all the way back to Africa, rather than live in slavery and chains. 
There are also myths of them having flown from the water, flown all the way home and back to Africa. Next, please. Beyonce referenced the Ibu landing myth in her video for the love for the song uh, Love Drought. And it's also a theme in the Daughters of the Dust film by Julie Dash. We've got this ancient connection to water. And yet a few years back, there was this uproar over Halle Bailey uh, being cast as the Little Mermaid in the Disney remake. She doesn't have red hair, you know, was one of the, the things that they were saying. Um, Next, please. But there she is, Halle Bailey, the Little Mermaid, red hair and all. Isn't she beautiful? It's going to be so nice for little girls to see that, for our, for our girls to see her uh, in that role. They just finished filming it, and uh, it'll be coming to a theater near you in 2023. Next, please. So there have always been black and brown mermaids and sea goddesses. Next, please. This sculpture comes from Angola and is called Dona Fish or Fish Woman or Madam Fish. She's also called Dona Fish in Zambia. This is Yeye Odo, Mother Water or Oshun, the goddess of cool waters of the Yoruba people in Nigeria, an Orisha known as a provider of children, also known, also known as owner of countless big fishes or mother of fish. In Congo, Basimbi inhabit rocks, gullies, streams, and pools, and are able to influence for the fertility and well-being of those living in the area. In low country South Carolina, they were called Simbis. Yamoja is a river goddess for the Yoruba people of Nigeria and Benin. She traveled to Brazil with enslaved Africans and became Yamanja, mother of the sea, a mermaid queen. Yamaya is a Cuban water goddess and ocean goddess, mother of water and protector of children and fishermen. Yama Yamaya is known to be mother of all, caring deeply for her children and doing all in her power to protect them. All of these water go goddesses can be called sisters of Mami Wada, mother of the waters, who appears in children's stories as a mystical character who often brings good or bad luck depending on one's characters on one's character. This is La Serene, she's from Haiti. She's the queen of mermaids. And this is Serena Williams, also known as the goat, the greatest of all time. Here she's on vacation in that same kind of pose. Um, if you have a chance, you can check out more of her story in King Richard, uh, excellent movie that's playing now in theaters. This is a woman who calls herself the Black Mermaid. Uh, after falling in love with the sea, Zandili Indolovu started the Black Mermaid Foundation and aims to introduce the ocean to South Africa's township youth. She's South Africa's first Black diving coach. So Mermaid Kinsey, the character in my picture book, swims in the ocean in the tradition of many other Black mermaids. And so here we have it, Mermaid Kinsey, Protector of the Deeps, not out until uh, January 18th, but you can pre-order. It's illustrated by Geneva Bowers. Mackenzie, Mama Mad again. Everybody know my name is Mermaid Kinsey, Protector of the Deeps. Mussy Mackenzie, Mama say. Clean up before beach. Mermaids don't clean up. Oh, mama say, then this mermaid don't go to the beach. But beach day, stones to skip, sand to castle, sun bleached sticks to dig for treasure, 
seashells buried in golden sand, shark teeth, a stream to cross holding mama's hand till I run off and ramble through the giant cave that echo, echo, echoes. Sometime we see a pelican parade. At night, lanternfish swim up from the deep, a festival of blue light. Higgledy-piggledy, I say, and attack the monstrous mound of mussy, downside-up, inside-out, jumbled stuff. Finally, the wavy dune. Hurry, mama. Sea waves whispering our favorite watery tune. Mist silver the water, briny taste on our tongue. Seaweed perfume the air. Gray the heron drift past, wing almost blocking the sun. The high arch of the cave calls. I poke pockets of shadow, then an earthy shock, a whiff of worm in my nose and wet rock. I skedaddle, wind whistle in my ear till I break at the rocky edge of the glittering sea where abracadabra waves turn into foam licking me. A tide pool waits and a drop of squirmy water to study with my microscope. A giant rock there too. I clamber up, 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 shivers in my tummy, pause, then plug my nose and slippy slide under the glossy blue. Kinsey, mermaid Kinsey. Mama head for our blue bottom boat, Josephina dose, seabirds crooning and about to sail off song. I wiggle into my mermaid tail, grab my spear and net and we set sail. We read the ocean like other folks study books. I look for seabirds and turtles and dolphins and whales and my seal buddy Coco, snout smooth as sea glass, spiraling, spiraling through waves with her zip zoomy tail. Mama puts on her snorkel and mask, bubble cheeks, then we seek, sink into the water chute past a school of silvery fish, wafting in shafts of filtered light, Sea fans swaying, my coils wave too, inside the deepening, darkening blue. The shipwreck rests on the sandy floor, littered with bottles and netting and trash. I kick my tail into a swarm of moon jellies. No, plastic bags. Backstroking, heart beat, beat, beating in my ear. I can't believe it more plastic bags than fish. When I was a girl, the sea was an underwater zoo, mama say. Octopus, jellyfish, fingerlings, krill, squishy, squashy sea creatures. What can I do? The ocean is a promise, mama say. It's broken now, I sigh, look. Will these plastic bits end up in the bellies of my friends like Coco? I search the waves for my freckle-faced chum and the seabirds and teep turtles and dolphins and whales. It ends up inside us too, mama say. The ocean is turning into plastic stew, I sing. Oh, my friend, friends, what shall we do? I grab my spear and mermaid net and scoop what junk I can. But you said mermaids don't clean up, mama say. Higgledy piggledy, I say. This mermaid cleans up for my sea pals. I'm proud for you, mama say, eyes twinkling. Back on the shimmery shore, I spot trash everywhere. Beach do up day, I declare. Then I whip my tail and swing my net. We'll help some new friends roar. I am mermaid Kinsey, protector of the deeps, I sing, then spike plastic bags and straws and cups until the glittery lip of the sea is clean. And I'm just going to read a little bit from the author's note um, at the back of the book about plastic in our oceans. When I was a girl growing up in the Pacific Northwest, I loved to eyeball whales. Tuxedoed orca, sleek, pearlescent belugas at the aquarium. As a grown up, when I saw photographs of beach whales, bellies swollen with pounds and pounds of plastic waste, I was horrified. 
Other sea creatures have also been found stuffed with garbage. Albatross who normally devour colorful crustaceans, gulp checkers and markers, buttons and beads. Sea turtles swallow shopping bags instead of jellyfish. Where is all this trash coming from? When Sea Captain Charles Moore sailed from Honolulu back to Los Angeles in 1997, he didn't know he would cruise into a plastic stew in the Pacific Ocean. This monstrous dump of floating trash in the middle of the sea is now called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. I was shocked to learn the garbage includes everything from rubber ducks, ping pong balls and dolls to flip flops, glue sticks and diapers. Oceans are downhill from everywhere, so plastic scoots, floats, and sails down to the deeps. Plastic is so lightweight that wind plucks it from trash cans, garbage cans, garbage trucks, and landfills and blows it out to sea. Then the plastic breaks down into tiny bits and ends up in the bellies of our water living friends. Even if we don't litter and live hundreds of miles from the sea, our plastic stuff can still wind up in the ocean. So it's important for us to use as little plastic as we can. Uh, next, Z. and then I was also happy to learn out learn about uh, these superheroes. A lot of young people all over the world who are working to uh, uh, battle plastic pollution in their countries. This is another scientist, Crystal Ambrose. She visited the Western Pacific uh, garbage patch and then founded the Bahamas plastic movement, movement to stop plastic pollution in island nations. 70% of tourists choose the Bahamas as their vacation destination because of the beaches, but as plastic infests the beaches, it infects the water causing marine species, including mahi-mahi ma, mahi, mahi and grouper, fish that Bahamians and tourists alike consume. She also works along with her plastic plastic warriors, uh, yeah, like John John here. Uh, she has a whole group of uh, young people that go out and clean up beaches and they're trying to get people to reduce their use of single use plastic. Uh, okay, and so that is it. And now I guess it's time for those questions. Thank you so much, Ms. Charlotte, that was great. So my first question is, what inspired you to write this book? Well, I was thinking about a couple of things. Number one, like as I get uh, you know, up in age, I wanted to leave a legacy in terms of the kind of books that I left for children. And so the issues that were the most important for me at, you know, at that time were, um, and still are, are black children and self-esteem and, and self-pride and of course the environment. And so, like I say, having grown up around a lot of water and loving it and um, loving to look at it and um, seeing what was happening in terms of the plastic pollution, um, that's, that's what inspired me to write it. I wanted to encourage, try to encourage people, children to, understand that a lot of the, the toys and things that they play with and then throw away um, end up harming um, other living creatures. Uh, so it's also, you know, I've watched my uh, older daughter and my granddaughters and she is kind of a minimalist. And so she, even though, you know, the girls get bombarded with gifts uh, a lot of stuff that they don't need, a lot of toys they play with and, you know, for a little while and then get rid of. But she has been really aggressive about having them be mindful about having too much like plastic, especially plastic junk that they don't really need. So if I can plant a seed about maybe reducing consumption of unnecessary things, um, I, that would help too. All right, thank you. Um, what is the book's take home message? What did you want everyone to get out of this? I, I think again, it would be like to reduce the use of plastic, um, reuse whatever things that you can, uh, that, you, that you have your belongings and uh, recycling, you know, recycle just to try to be a good steward of the environment wherever you are, if it's just in your own bedroom. Like initially when I wrote 
um, in the early drafts of Mermaid Kinsey, I was really focused on the junk because I was so shocked by the the, the kind of things that you that, that were found in the plastic in the um, Pacific garbage dump. I was just shocked by that, and so initially, you know, the the words and everything were just focused on checkers and markers and <laughs> you know dolls and flip flops and all that kind of stuff. And then my editor was like, well, the illustrator can't just illustrate pages and pages of trash. You know, nobody wants to see that. So um, I had to refocus and just concentrate on what we love about the ocean or the beaches when we go and play. And uh, so focus on that beauty and just have readers remember like, yeah, I want to keep it like that. I don't want to harm, uh, you know, sea creatures. I don't want the, the beach to be trashed when we get there, so. Yeah, and I, I definitely believe it's hard to kind of find that middle ground where you can speak your, oh, I'm sorry, we just had our lights go off, where you can say your conservation message to your students but, or to your children, but also um, make it known that you can still be okay in the environment and you can help. I think that's definitely a hard thing to do without scaring them and um, causing a little bit of like ecophobia. Yeah, yeah. That's why I, I was really excited to see like a lot of young people who just started doing things. I, there's a young boy uh, in Florida, he just started picking up garbage off the off the beach. You know, it's it's so it's like it's that simple. Is it can be as simple as just you know cleaning up your room, you know. So um, <laughs> that can help out too. Um, would you have any tips for new writers? Um, I would. I I, you know, I'm somebody who wanted to be a writer since I was in grade school. So. I've always been a bookworm, a nerd, you know, so, you know, reading, reading as much as you can, reading as widely as you can, reading fiction, nonfiction, poetry, graphic novels, just reading all kinds of genres so that you can kind of get a sense for where you might want to write and fit into the, the literary landscape. Um, yeah, so that's my main tip is, is reading as much as you can. And then also writing, like for a lot of people, a lot of people start out um, keeping a journal or a notebook of some kind and writing your thoughts down, writing what happens, you know, during your day, questions you might have about life, incidents you might witness, things you might not understand. Just start writing those things down and keeping track of those and collecting them and then and experimenting with um, trying to emulate some of the writing that you read. So, you know, I mean, I my favorite writer is Toni Morrison, but, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm no Toni Morrison, but still, she was like the goal, you know, she was always the goal for me. So that was something for me to stretch towards as I experimented in my own writing. Um, I noticed that within the book, you kind of um, used a bit of AAVE or African American Vernacular English. Is there a specific reason why you decided to go with that route? It wasn't intentional. It was just that's how I heard the story. A lot of times as, as writers, some of us, we hear the words and then we write them down. And so that's the way I heard the story. And, but also, you know, that's the way people I, around, you know, that's the way people I, in my family, that's the way we talk. So we can go back and forth uh, in the way that we talk. And so for me, that has always had a musical quality to it and a beauty to it. And so there was a point actually where I knew there are people who would, cause, because I've written that way before in other pieces. And so I know that there are people who won't understand it, or there might be some pushback, or they're like, well, you don't talk like that. Why, why are you writing like that? But, um, you know, it's always been beautiful to me, that just the sound of it, the musicality of it. So, uh, but I did get questioned about it by someone that I trusted 
Uh, and right before it was about to be, I think, copy edited. So it was like in the final stages. Because this is someone whose opinion I valued, you know, very highly, I changed it. I took I took it all out because I was like, she's right. And not only that, it was during the pandemic. It's, you know, the heart of the pandemic. So I wasn't at my best self anyway. But um, yeah, so I changed it. And then like my editor and then like, you know, the publisher, they wanted to have a sit down, you know, no, not a sit down, but over, you know, phone, Zoom or some kind of conversation about me changing it in that way because they publish it because of the, the voice. That's what they like. So I think a lot of times we can think that we have to be, I don't know, we have to speak in a certain kind of way or write in a certain kind of way. And that, that can kind of erase the flavor of who we are. And so, you know, before I even had that conversation with them, I had a conversation with the original editor, who's also a person of color. And so, I, you know, I could go back and forth with her about it. And so and then I changed it back. But it's it's just a sound that I love. It's people that I love. They talk like that. I don't think there's anything wrong or, or lesser than, you know, I think there's beauty in it. So there it is. Um, based on where the, um, the illustrations in your, in your book, can you tell me where exactly it takes place? It seems like California to me based off of like kelp forests, but do you have a thought of where you wanted it to take place, where Kenzie is from? In my, you know, in my, in my imagination, I'm, you know, I have a kind of wild imagination. So it's like, I don't always ground things in reality. So for me, there's a little bit of Southern California, uh, you know, there's a little bit of the Caribbean, you know, there's, to me, it's like wherever there's black people and water and they can put a boat in the water, you know, that, that's where it's set. Uh, a lot of it at the time I was living near uh, a marine sanctuary. So I, you know, I, a lot of this I saw, like, as I was walking, you know, I, I did a lot of, like, long distance walks uh, near the shore there. And so, like, the name for the boat, Josephina Dos, that's a real boat, you know, that I saw. Coco is a real seal that I would see uh, in the marina that, uh, there. So, yeah, I mean, it's wherever we are with the boat and water. That's, that's where it's set. All right. So it is kind of like loosely based on your life and um, kind of how you grew up. Well, I mean, for me, it's only only in that I love water and have been, you know, kind of lived around water and that kind of thing. But it's the mother and the daughter. I kind of based on my eldest daughter and my eldest granddaughter. Um, uh, yeah, so it's it's a little bit taken from real life but I actually can't swim but um <laughs> you know I love water I love it but uh, I can't swim I it's that generational kind of thing that was passed down from my mother who uh, almost drowned in a pond in Mississippi so uh, she passed that fear on to me but I wanted to break that generational curse and so my daughters learned how to swim I I stayed out of it. And then my, you know, cause I didn't want my fear to be carried over into them. And then my granddaughters, um, I also participated in taking them to swimming lessons. So they started swimming like before they were two years old. So they, so it, when I think about mermaids, cause I tease them and call them mermaids cause they can just, you know, they can breaststroke. I mean, they can do, <laughs> they're like fantastic swimmers which I'm really proud of and just happy that, happy to see a generational curse be broken, you know? So, yeah. Um, as a person of color myself and as a, a black woman, I personally haven't seen really, um, a lot of books, especially like Marine based books about me. So it's, it makes me very happy to see this book from you, but, um, no problem. But I was wondering if you have any, um, anything you would like to say to like the young black girls or the any girls of color, children of color who may not see themselves in things like this until now. Yeah, I mean, I didn't see myself in, the, in these kinds of books either when I was growing up. I mean, I, I feel grateful that there are the books out 
you know, that children can look at now. And I think like that's where the power of our imagination comes in because even when we we're not seen in certain spaces, that doesn't mean that we can't imagine in our minds and and plant a vision of ourselves doing that thing or being in that place. Um, I, I especially feel that strongly after seeing King Richard and, and seeing the Serena and Venus Williams story and what they did in terms of the world of tennis. So a lot of times we are, we're not we may not be visible somewhere, but we can still get into that space. We can find ways around the gatekeeping and 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 we can get into that space. So I'm just thrilled that you are in the field that you're in. Uh, you know, more black girls will see you out there doing your thing, you know, and that will encourage them because we all know representation matters. And if you don't, sometimes, a lot of times, if you don't see it, you can't imagine it. But I feel the strength and power of our imaginations as black people, we've had to imagine ourselves in places where we didn't see ourselves. So, and we're able to do that. So. Um, on that note, uh, have you had an overall good experience as a Black woman who was an author, or um, have you faced any challenges at all throughout this Ooh. time? Ooh. Whoa, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that strikes a nerve. Uh, no, like the good, the good, the best parts to me, and I would encourage this of other uh writers, young writers and old writers, is getting connected with other writers. I was lucky enough that when I first started publishing, um, one of my first publications was in a, it was in an anthology of women of color in the Northwest. So that was my first exposure to other uh, Black women writers, uh, you know, who were doing their thing in various kinds, you know, it was fiction, poetry, whatever, essays. But from that anthology, I connected with them and we eventually formed a group, you know, so we had a support group. We could, and we met on a regular basis. We could share our writing. We could get feedback on our writing and also just talk about life stuff. Um, so just having, getting plugged into some kind of network of support is important. Um, right now there's a, there's an organization called Black Creators and Kid Lit. So if you're uh, someone who's interested in writing for children, you can uh, find them on Twitter, Black Creators and Kid Lit, and tie into that network. They provide all kinds of resources and support for, for Black writers. Um, so that for me is like the, the best part. I mean, I've had the opportunity, like my favorite writers of all time were like Toni Morrison and August Wilson. I had an opportunity to actually meet August Wilson and, you know, take, I pick, I have the pictures. So I have proof that I, you know, I actually met this man. Uh, I was too intimidated to actually read my own work in front of him <laughs> at the event, but I still do have the pictures. Uh, which I'm, you know, they're they're my treasure. One of, you know, one of my treasures. Um, I, I had an opportunity to to actually sit in a room with Toni Morrison. I did not take it because I didn't feel I was so, you know. I mean, I put her on a goddess. I mean, I put her on a, you know, she's just like, you know what I mean? It's like she's, and so it's like I felt like I hadn't done any work that was worthy of sitting in the same room with her and calling myself a writer as well. I, do I regret that now? No, because I still, I still feel that way. But uh, anyway, I just had, yeah. So anyway, networks of support, that's the best part. The worst part of course is learning how to deal with rejection because all, most, I'll say 99% of writers, you're gonna get rejected. And you might end up getting rejected a lot, especially as you start out and you begin to develop your craft and your craft gets stronger and stronger over the years. Hopefully, you know, I still feel like the, I've been doing this a long time and I'm still at the, you know, the beginning. I still feel like I'm learning and I never try to stop learning. So I always take classes or read writing books, you know, talk to other writers, um, network with other writers, like again, but the, the, the bad part is the rejection. The bad part is, um, I don't know. There's a lot of um, uh, statistics that have come out in recent years about, especially in children's publishing, 
but in all publishing really, about those low numbers of books that are published by tra traditional publishers um, in terms of Black writers. And so that, I never really paid a lot of attention to that because I just always assumed I was gonna do it, you know, cause it was always something I always wanted to do. And early on, like that group of women writer friends that I talked about, we sat down with a writer and who was a, also a professor at the University of Washington. And she told us, the first thing she told us, we were all eager and just, you know, excited about, it. she's gonna tell us and she's gonna jazz us up, right? And like the first thing she said, the first words out of her mouth, where if you can stop writing, stop, because it is a hard road to be on. And so, you know, we were kind of a little bit crushed, <laughs> but it had discussions and all of us were people who had wanted to write from young ages. And so we came to that realization that, well, okay, there might be a lot of rejection. We might not get published like we wanna get published, but we're gonna probably end up writing, you know, and as long as we can hold some kind of instrument or type, you know, as long as we are drawing breath, we're gonna keep trying to write. So that was kind of our bottom line. So I, I never paid attention to those kinds of statistics or anything like that, uh, but it's been sitting with me lately. So that, that is, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's hard. It's, it's, it's not easy. I can't sugarcoat it. Um, I don't know what the answer is. I remember reading one of the articles and they were saying that basically to get published nowadays, traditionally published, you have to kind of be at like a Beyonce level writer. You know what I mean? And so, you know, I'm no Beyonce either. I'm not Toni Morrison. I'm not Beyonce. You know, I'm just me trying to do, you know, do my little stories and pieces and things. So that was, uh, it's discouraging, especially when you see people that don't look like you, who don't write like Beyonce or Toni Morrison, you know, continue to publish books. So I feel like that's where drawing on our history of resilience as Black people. I mean, look at the things that our ancestors couldn't do, you know, and they kept trying and kept doing things. So I try to draw on that kind of strength and fortitude and never give up. You know, I still keep, I just keep trying. I try different things. There are people who go the self-publishing route. So you don't have to just focus on, you know, like the quote unquote New York publishers. You can publish it yourself and get it out there. And some people have been able to do that and then get the New York publishers to come to them and want to publish their, their future books. So there are different avenues. It just depends on, you know, what you have inside you and what your, your goal is and dream for yourself is. But I, my, my, my main thing is like, never give up, never give up. That's great. Um, I know you said that you wanted to write your whole life. Like as a little girl, you knew you wanted to write. Was um, there like a specific book or a time that you remember where it just clicked for you? Like, this is what you want to do? Oh, I, you know, I don't. And, and because like when I was a kid, you know, they, we didn't, I didn't have like Black books. I didn't have Black characters in books. So what I remember is like Pippi Longstocking, Heidi, you know, reading Little House on the Prairie. You know, those are the kind of books that I read. But it, I mean, I still love them. And I still put myself, uh, you know, in the, the character's shoes. So that carried me on until like when I was in uh, middle school in seventh grade, a teacher, actually a white male teacher, uh, handed me the autobiography of Malcolm X. And that, that's the book that really, I would say the first book that changed my life because, you know, I went to these schools where I was one of few black or brown kids. And, you know, you hear when it says, and it comes to anything about you that you, at that time, what I heard was, you know, slavery. And so I, you know, would, you know, like I, you know, felt a little bit of shame around that, not a little bit, I felt shame around that. 
And so um, reading that story, it flipped, it flipped everything for me because I, I came to realize like, I wasn't the one that needed to be ashamed. I wasn't the one. And so the autobiography of Malcolm X, learning more about black history, um, that's, that's what changed everything. I did because I was from Seattle and you know, I had a high school teacher who gave me books by James, James Baldwin. And so that was the first, other than Malcolm X, the first black writer I think I read. And so, but then it was kind of like, oh, I can't be a writer because I'm not from Harlem, you know? Like whoever heard of a black writer from Seattle. So that was a part of my, <laughs> that's a part of my legacy too. But I got over that. And so then in college, you know, I, you know, was, I had a black professor, uh, creative writing uh, instructor who then opened up my world even bigger because even larger because he introduced us to the black women writers Alice Walker Toni Morrison you know so it's like that was a whole new world so so that was a, another step on the journey and then another step came when I had a friend who was a who's an artist a visual artist and her partner worked at a bookstore. And so they were widely read. And so then they introduced me to like reading South, you know, Latin American literature, you know, and Native American writers. And so I could find the kind of writing style that made sense to me, you know, because I didn't write like the white men in these books. I didn't, you know, and so it's, so it's like, you don't, <clears throat> I didn't see myself there. So, but, as I looked and read more widely, I was like, oh, okay, this is, a, this is, a, I like to write like this, so I can, I can write like these writers. So just being on that kind of a journey, um, and, it, and it's ongoing, it's, you know, I still continue, like I said, I still feel like, a, you know, early, I'm, I'm still a beginner, I'm still learning, still trying to learn, so. I don't even know if that answered your question. No, it did, it did, thank you. <laughs> okay. I hope so. Um, do you have any intentions of making Mermaid Kinsey into a series? Well, yeah, that was my original uh, goal. And so, I mean, I've written the second one. Uh, my publisher wants to see if this one sells. Uh, and so I'm going to give them a certain amount of time and then if, you know, and have them make a decision and then I'll, I'll move on because I do want it to be a a series and the second one is about you know sea turtles and then now that I know about black and marine science you know and and, and my minorities and shark science I I want to like you know I I got to do a third one and a, maybe a third or maybe a fourth one about sharks you know I might do one about rays I don't know but uh yeah I want to I want to keep it going but you know we'll see we'll see what happens I personally um don't at this moment in time have the energy to pursue self-publishing so that's why i'm kind of where i am but uh i you know if i have to do it I, I think i will because you guys are inspiring me i've been seeing these posts about different people doing different you know researching microplastics and all this just fascinating wonderful to me this is like afrofuturism like you got you guys are doing it you guys are doing it. So it's it's really exciting and inspiring to me as a writer to want to support what you're doing uh, out in the world with our children, you know, because there was a time where we had more black children, not black children, but black students in the sciences and math than we do today. There was a time where we had, we were pursuing that, you know, in larger numbers. And for whatever reason, uh, the numbers have dropped off. So I want to support what you guys are doing. You guys are doing some, you know, some challenging, wonderful, futuristic stuff. So they're trying, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I see you. All right. Um, I'm gonna end it with our last question. I know you mentioned that Toni Morrison is one of your inspirations, but do you have any other inspirations? Besides Toni Morrison yes. um, or August Wilson, um, you know, my inspiration really, it's a black history. 
that is really my inspiration. Inspiration. I love our history. Um, I don't think there. I, no, I don't think there's people like us. Like, look at what we create. You know, we've been. They've tried to destroy us, and look at what we still are do out here doing, doing it to death in so many different ways. So. Yeah, I'd have to say that's Black history is, is my inspiration behind Toni Morrison and Akis Wilson. Yes. All right. Thank you so much for coming and reading to us. And um, we hope that we see you again. And Mermaid Kenzie is great. Thank you so um, much for having me. Yes, of course. So everyone, thank you for reading with us today. Um, if you have any questions about today's book or author, please follow them on their social media. You can follow Miss Charlotte Sherman on her Instagram at Charlotte Watson Sherman, and you can follow her on Twitter at Emerald City Char. You can also follow me on Instagram at Aquatic Alexis. And make sure to follow Black and Marine Sciences for more of our events this week. Our next event will be Compass BEMS Week Message Box Workshop, Tuesday, November 30th, 1130 to 130. So make sure to tune in. You don't want to miss it. And uh, thank you. Uh, again, I'm Chris Howard, the Chief Relations Officer for BEMS. Uh, we really enjoyed that, uh, that read, Charlotte, in your, in your talk today. Thank you. And uh, we're going to be giving away a copy of Mermaid Kinsey, Director of the Deep. And we have a question for you guys watching there. Um, it is, name one of the Black uh, mermaids from the diaspora. So we just uh, put that in the chat there and answer that question for us. Okay, we are waiting. Um, I just put it in the chat. So the question is, name one of the Black mermaids um, from the diaspora that she talked about today. Um, so yeah, if you write it in the YouTube chat, the first one that puts one of them in there, um, we'll get a free copy of the book. So I don't know, maybe they weren't. Oh, somebody said Maine Wadi. Was that one? Yeah, you got it. Okay, Lisa, let's go. <laughs> So Lisa, if you can email um, info at mems.org, yeah, I'll put this in the chat um, with your information, just put in the uh, put in the subject line that you're getting the free giveaway and we will get you your book. All right, Chris, you can close this out. All right, and again, this is uh, BIMS Reads. Be sure to you know, follow the rest of the events we have going on today and throughout the rest of the week. And thanks for watching today. Thank you.